Hello, I'd like to welcome everybody to tonight's program. Um, we are reading the tributes of the American Academy of Arts and Letters, and I'm Billy Chen, the president of the Academy. Since 1903, the Academy has presented tributes to members who have passed away. These are typically read at our headquarters building in New York City before our spring and fall dinners. This year, because of the pandemic, we are presenting tributes virtually. This is a live reading of tributes to six Academy members. The writers, Francine Duplessis Gray and Donald Keane. The poet, W.S. Merwin. The painter, Thomas Noskowski. The architect, Kevin Roche. And the composer, George Walker. These are being recorded and will be posted to our website in the next few days. So to begin with, um, I'd like to introduce Nicholas Weber, the executive director of the Joseph and Annie Albers Foundation. And tonight he joins us from Ireland. He will read the tribute to Francine Duplessis Gray. Marvelous photos. I first met Francine in 1972 at a show of African art in Litchfield. From the moment that she and Cleve entered, they exuded panache. Staring into a mask from Molly, Francine exemplified Paul Clay's saying that the experience of art is not when you look at it, but when it looks at you. Francine's eyes and the eyes on the mask were staring at one another as she imbibed the force of this small, vibrant object. To quote her verbatim, art is both a vengeance against reality and a reconciliation with it. That was Francine. Everything the essence of what it was, emotions at full force, a capacity to reconcile opposites and delight in the coexistence of dichotomies. I next saw Francine in 1990. I was writing a biography of the painter Baltus and a piece she wrote in The New Yorker made me want her insights on the psychoanalytic study of the Marquis de Sade by Baltus's brother, Pierre Kozowski. I phoned, reintroduced myself and told her, why I was calling. She did not mince words. I'm not sure there is anything I can tell you that I've not already put into what I wrote, but feel free to come see me if you want. She was to the point and responded to my praise of her writing with, well, I don't know about that, but since you live in Bethany, it will take you 55 minutes to get to Warren. So come on Friday at 3 p.m. No, no. Make it 310. <laughs> this was something that Catherine, my wife, and I relished about Francine. Following that meeting in Warren, we and Cleve and Francine became fast friends, and every encounter required precision and corrections in the timing. No, not 715 at West Street Grill. Let's make it 705. That way, we'll get served before the wait people start fawning over celebrities from Litchfield. Come to think of it, 645. That instinct for clockwork fit Francine's desire for order and discipline. She had these qualities in spades. She was clear, succinct, and to the point. She distinguished between 730 and 735, the way that she cited someone's ancestry or referred to a character and in Moliere, impeccably. When I went to discuss Kozowski with Francine, I had read enough by her to anticipate trenchant perceptions, but the visit was full of surprises. 
First of all, the person I expected to be intimidating was not. She was smiling and gracious and spoke to me as if to a school chum of Luke or Thaddeus, her exceedingly nice and amiable sons. When we got to our subject, she was not just insightful, but generous. Ideas were to be shared, not hoarded. Francine's New Yorker text was similar to what she wrote in 2006 in her introduction to the Marquis de Sade's philosophy in the boudoir. That text is exemplary of her writing, fast paced, dauntingly intelligent, grounded in absolute truths and seductive without being salacious. It delves deeply into human behavior while it entertains us. The ideas are original and the language judicious. She could pack information into a sentence while keeping you as spellbound as if you're at a great movie. To quote, Saad became a hunted man, the victim of his outlandish need for sexual experimentation. In his most outrageous debauch to date, he had traveled to the nearby metropolis of Marseille to choreograph a particularly festive orgy with four prostitutes and his valet at which he passed out some sloppily concocted aphrodisiacs. These treats caused the girls to feel ill for 24 hours. Two of them brought charges of sodomy and attempted poisoning against Sod and a week later, he received the first of many official warrants that would be issued by the kings of France, first Louis XV, then Louis XVI, for his arrest. He continued to live on the lamb for the next few years, seeking refuge in Italy or in the wilds of Vaucluse. But in 1777, after a few more outrageous bacchanals, he was finally captured thanks to the cunning of the woman who would be his nemesis, his altogether remarkable mother-in-law, Madame de Montreuil, who had successfully lobbied Louis XVI for a letter de cachet, or sealed letter. This was an arbitrary order of arrest and detention that could be issued and signed only by the king and could imprison the accused for life without any legal hearing, close quote. Now that is writing. Who else could shift linguistic tone as she does in sloppily concocted homemade aphrodisiacs? Who else would take us inside Saad's mind, inform us about the French legal code and proceed with such pace through years of her subject's life leading to his arrest. Who else would write with such elegance while interjecting lightness with the term on the lamb, used initially for gangsters? I assume that you know Francine's basic story. She was born in 1930 in Warsaw to a Russian mother and a father who was a French diplomat. She was brought up in Paris until her father, Vicomte Bertrand Yoko du Plessis was shot down in the Free French Air Force near Gibraltar in 1940. Her mother fled to New York where she married Alexander Lieberman, also a white Russian emigre. Figures in the New York fashion world, they were the subject of Francine's book, Them, inspiring Francine to say, quote, lovers, children, heroes, None of them do we fantasize as extravagantly as we fantasize our parents. Francine went to Spence and then Bryn Mawr, graduated from Barnard, was night desk reporter for UPI, worked for various magazines, married Cleve in 1957, and moved to Connecticut where they brought up Luke and Thaddeus and enjoyed visits from beloved grandchildren. She had, it's a wonderful expression and too rarely applicable, a mind like a steel trap. The dictionary defines this as meaning, quote, a remarkably efficient mind, great skill in learning and reasoning, close quote. 
I remember when in the late 90s, we were searching for an architect for the Albers Foundation and had, we thought, cast our net wide. But Francine had no doubt that one, that no one on our shortlist was the answer. You must have Tim Prentice, she said. He studied with Joseph Albers, met Annie, and knows how to build for Connecticut winters. The result of her authoritative advice and that most perfect steel trap mind reflects so many of Francine's own qualities, logic, practicality, creativity, mastery of one's profession, and heart. Toward the end of her life, Francine said, quote, I venture that those of us who are most serene when faced with the possibility of nothingness are the ones who have reached furthest to the downward and upward of their beings. How honest, how real, how tender, and how wonderful from someone who always reached upward. That was amazing. Um, thank you, Nick. Donald Keene's adopted son, Seiki, joins us from Tokyo to read our next tribute. Donald King's direct relationship with Japan began in 1942 when he entered the United States Navy Japanese language school. From that time on, there was never a moment when he forgot Japan and the Japanese language as he pursued his studies of Japanese literature and culture. I have always felt a tremendous admiration, almost a sense of awe at the quantity and quality of my father's work, at its broadness and its depths. At its base was a deep knowledge and understanding not only of Japan, but of Western culture and art as well. That is why his writings and lectures were so compelling. Even in his last years, he kept up his research, approaching it with the dedication of a young man and extraordinary powers of concentration. I still marvel at that. My father's intellect and sensibility shaped his research, but it was passion and love for his subject that drove him on. In this way, without conscious intent, in a natural manner, his research transcended considerations of utility and became a splendid bridge linking Japan and America. As an educator too, he nurtured and trained many outstanding students. There was another side of my father too, and that was how much he liked people and took pleasure in his friendships, of which he had many. He was very proud of being a member of the academy and always looked forward to talking with the other members and dining with them. He had affectionate relationships with his students as well, almost as if they were family or friends, 
they, in their turn, looked up to my father as a treasure's mentor who inspired deep respect. At the core of his life story was something else as well. My father had experienced in his own body the tragedy of war. He loved peace and he hated with a passion discrimination of any kind. Once he was asked, what is a true international person? And he answered, someone who always feels that you and I are the same. We are both human beings. It seems to me that my father's life embodies that ideal. In 2011, six months after the great Tohoku earthquake and the disasters that followed, my father left New York and moved wholly to Japan. But even after that, he came to New York every year. His last visit was in March of 2018. He himself said, this is the last time I will see New York. And so it was. Then on June 18th, on his birthday, he said, this will be the last time I celebrate my birthday. He seemed to foresee his own end with a calm certainty. My father died on the 24th day of February, 2019. He was 96 years and eight months old. There were many things that he still wished to do but he left behind a huge body of work and he had an extremely happy life. In his later years, he often said to me, I have been so lucky. This is the happiest I have ever been. He breathed his last without suffering at peace with himself and the world. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Seiki. Jane Kramer, Academy member, author, and longtime New Yorker journalist, will read the tribute to W.S. Merwin. William, who died in March last year, was family. We met in Paris years ago when he brought his young stepson, John, to Vincent and my, Vincent's and my garden to court our daughter, Alexandra. William believed in the magic of gardens to seduce. In fact, the three things he cherished most in life were his wife, Paula, several generations of beautiful, if overprotective chows, and the vast garden at, at Haiku in Maui, where he planted and nurtured more than 2,000 palm trees, many from species that would have disappeared without him. He once told Paula, that, he to, once told me that Paula, the dogs and those endangered palms bridged the inspirational balance of his work and life. William was a self-proclaimed, if somewhat disingenuous, Luddite once he settled down in Maui. It took a lot of patience on Paula's part to introduce intrusive objects like a telephone and a fridge into the house he built there. But once she did, he was addicted. He liked to squirrel away in his study and phone his mainland friends with endless admonitions and instructions for a healthy, nature-enhancing life. I pick up the phone in my study in New York where I'm speaking from, and the first thing I'd hear was, Jane, 
please don't tell me that you're still eating meat. He would then lecture me on my unfortunate, if only occasional T-bones cravings, extracting promises about my eating habits, after which, and only then, could we start talking about his poems. It's been said that William honed his gifts for languages, for translation. He, he could translate anything and his, I would, um, I would recommend, I don't even know what to recommend first, but one of my favorite things he wrote is, um, an, uh, is a, an, a kind of contemporary English um, version of Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, which is one of the most oddly erotic um, and almost violent poems I have ever read. He was, he was dazzling at getting the root out of the the language from which he was translating. Anyway, he had that gift for language and for translation, and of course, for his own poetry. As a boy attempting to write his exceptionally door, Presbyterian minister's father's hymns and sermons, he got over that. Um, for years, he led what could be considered an enviably cosmopolitan life. In the Dordogne, in London, in Mallorca, and New York, to name just a few stops on his itinerary. He was also quite good looking in a romantic um, sort of way. He looked like a poet and he was much feted. But by the time he moved to Hawaii in the 1970s, he was also committed to the study of Zen Buddhism, to a more meditative life, walking only at the perennial invitations to join his old Buddhist friend, Peter Mathewson, for two penitential weeks each summer, sleeping on the floor of the Zurich Bahnhof, begging for their food. William wasn't all that interested in vicissitude. He liked to fish, to canoe, to walk to Rome. He marveled at what he called the astonishments of nature. I don't know how many times he was asked to become poet laureate. Apparently there were many, but he always said that he was waiting for a president who was, quote, not a Republican and, quite importantly, was Hawaiian born. Then, miraculously, Barack Obama called. William was reigned at the Smithsonian long distance from the middle of the Pacific, but with dedication. The last reading William gave in New York took place in 2013 at the 92nd Street Y when he was in his mid eighties. His good friend and our late and one time Academy president, Sandy McClatchy introduced him. And the first thing William told Sandy on the stage that night was by way of an apology. He could no longer read, he said. He was fast losing his eyesight but he reminded his audience that there was quite a, a respectable tradition of blind poets, if you considered Homer, say, or Milton. It was a bardic tradition mm -hmm. and also an epic tradition. And as it happens, William had also written, written a beautiful epic poem, The Folding Cliffs, 13 years earlier, drawn from native legends about the coming of strangers to the Hawaiian Islands in the 1800s with leprosy in their wake. Tonight, as he described it later, he was going to read with his mind's eye. And in the end, he gave what must have been one of the purest readings his audience had ever heard. It bypassed the page and came straight from the heart and soul of poetry and needed no mediation by way of flag tagged underlined pages. You could hear a pin drop at the Y that night. And I swear we all had tears in our eyes by the time he finished the poem that you will hear him read now to Paula in the spring. Now listen. And then there's a, I want to read another poem. Uh, uh, this is addressed to my wife, Paula. Uh, uh, and um, I think it's, I don't need to say anything about it. I think it's self-explanatory. Uh, let me imagine that we will come again when we want to, 
and it will be spring. We will be no older than we ever were. The worn griefs will have vanished like the white cloud through which the morning slowly comes to itself. The ancient defenses against the dead will be over and left to the dead at last. The light will be as it is now in this garden that we have made in these years together of our long evenings of astonishment. Thank you, Jane. That's amazing. Artist, critic, and curator Robert Storr will read the tribute to Thomas Nuskowski. First, though, we have a brief film by Thomas Nuskowski's son, Casimir Nuskowski. Most of the painting uh, where the central image really came from a blueberry, the big fat blueberry, and uh, the color red of the leaves in the fall. And somehow it, it reminded me of um, the uh, resurrection panel in uh, Grunewald's Eisenheim altarpiece. Now, I mean, this may sound like a completely absurd conflation, but uh, I think it's fabulously interesting that one could go from a blueberry to a resurrection. Um, I mean, it's pretty crazy and bizarre, but I, I, I like the, um, I like the possibility. I mean, the possibility excites me. This is maybe what I'm most interested in in painting, uh, to be able to make connections and find things uh, that are uh, impossible, just impossible things. Look at this over here, this uh, pretty nifty triangle of stone that, uh, this tree has grown around and kind of kept propped up. You know, how would that be in a painting? You know, what, what could that be in a painting? Could that be pointing to something, you know? Um, interesting. Amazing rock, isn't it? Yeah. With the plants going up through it, fabulous. It would be foolish of me to say that there is one kind of source for the body of my work, because in fact, I try to uh, vary the kinds of sources for my, uh, for my paintings. Um, I think it does matter. I think you have to care about what you're making a picture of. Um, but I think that as a you know, grown up adult human being, you care about a lot of things. And you care about things in different ways, and that's interesting too. So, um, you know, to make a painting about a family member is one thing. To make a painting about a landscape that is extraordinary is something else again. Um, I mean, certainly no artist could walk through a landscape like this over here without thinking of um, Cezanne's uh, The Quarries at Bibimus. Pines and rocks, I mean, it's very... Uh, uh, it's a nice connection. Uh, how about a quotidian landscape, the landscape of your backyard? Um, a different kind of a painting, I think. Um, a psychological landscape. I mean, there's a, a range of possibilities and they, they would create different modes of action, different ways of thinking about paint. Painting is a visual medium and it, it makes perfectly good sense to me that, uh, you know, if one sees something extraordinary, why not make a picture of it? Uh, if something happens to one that is extraordinary, what are the visual components of that extraordinary thing? Uh, I mean, I think artists think and act visually. That's, you know, uh, that's the simple part. When I uh, first started uh, painting this way a long time ago, uh, actually before you were born, we would come up here and um, walk around. And there was a particular area on the Peterskill that we were very enamored of with a bunch of waterfalls, one after the other, a whole sequence of waterfalls. And um, 
I did some very simple paintings that uh, had the arc of these falls, different parts on them, the way the water ran across rock, uh, whatever it was. And uh, for me, they, they were really important paintings, uh, not because uh, anybody on earth would have known that they were a very specific, that they came from a very specific place. But for me, it was interesting to see how many uh, kinds of images I could spin off from uh, something in the real world. For an abstract artist, this was a big, uh, a big learning experience. Uh, my realist friends, I'm, I'm sure, knew this from uh, infancy. But for me, it was a big, uh, big discovery. I think I'm on now. Is that, am I audible? Yes, you are. Um, hi, um, Thomas Laskowski's art is for those who relish navigation. That is to say, wandering through open spaces, engaging one's whereabouts by the markers and expansive terrain of the skies. Not that Tom ever painted landscapes as such in the manner of Arthur Gorky, who conflated animal, vegetable, and mineral forms in eroticized pastorals that remain unique in American art to this day. Though sometimes whimsically sexy in an analogous, in analogous biomorphic ways, seldom was Tom's work of a more than modest size. It had suggested an imaginative scale way beyond its actual measurements, albeit one that was consistently of the same vertical and horizontal uh, proportions. Tom thought big with, within a scope that he could manage. His body was the caliper. In that regard, his decisions about how large a painting should be were all, all variants on de Kooning's rule of thumb, but the measurements for a canvas should be should hew to Vitruvian calculus of a painter's reach. But whereas de Kooning used an easel or a wall and drawing with his and drew with his arm, Tom preferred dra drafting tables and drew with his hands and fingers. As a result, the majority of his mature canvases were 16 by 20 inches with a handful in the range of 22 by 28 inches and only a very few upwards of 30 by 40 inches. Which is to say that even at the lower end, his range uh, there were his range, uh, there were for the most part bigger than those, for example, Giorgio Morandi, who seldom uh, made anything approaching a meter in height or width, usually, work, usually working in rectangles, at least half that or less. This should suffice as proof that the currently fashionable adage, adage go big or go home, uh, does not uh, always apply to painting, not even in New York, not Shea Clement Greenberg. From start to finish then, Tom's work was always hands-on and wonder, wonder, wonderfully intuitive and replete with playful visual, uh, with visual playful, with playful visual references and wit. True, at the outset, it was frequently stare and moody, full of strange, even ominous shapes, and also full of dull hues and tonal blends, as if their components had just met each other for the first time when introduced or pushed together by the artist's brush. Later, Tom's forms were limbered up and mutated and fleshed out, while his palette was enriched and clarified on occasion, reaching nearly Baroque or Rococo levels of exuberance. Still, the collaborating protagonists of his art, color and contour, retained a uniquely quirky quality that resulted from their evident surprise at finding themselves in each other's company. If I have chosen to speak mostly in the terms of the physical reality of Tom's work, that is simply to signal that one understands and appreciates it best when one stays to the pendulum poesis. For like most fully realized and satisfying art in any medium or style, that poetry is, its, is in its making such that viewers who approach Tom's work should do so as one would a man hunched over a desk who is wholly absorbed in whatever he is doing. One can in effect read over Tom's shoulder what occurred to him in each given instance. How this patch of pigment could first blush and then by beautifully ambiguous increments become something quite different. How this bulge could morph into a new arabesque. How this mark could extend into a cadence of similar but never identical marks. On the, on the latter score, it was not for nothing that Tom became came of age artistically in the hiatus between abstract expressionism and minimalism. Nor was it an accident that one of his first champions was Betty Parson, who understood, he was, who understood what he was up to because she bridged the same aesthetic divide. None of which is to say that Tom lacked an intellectual rigor. He had that in spades, where, where useful he applied his critical curiosity to, in private to the analysis of his practice and kept, which kept evolving uh, along coherent, but mercifully never programmatic lines. 
Tom knew our history backwards and forwards and best of all sideways, meaning the unwritten history of art that inveterate gallery goers acquire and keep alive in memory long after fashions have changed, uh, fashions have faded and critical discourses have become fish wrap. Wisely, however, Tom siphoned off his intellectual surplus and applied it to his chief pleasures outside of looking at and thinking about the work of other painters. And that was the movies, as well as tangentially crime fiction. They were his uh, conversational violon dangue. At, at, this, at this juncture, it might be useful to mention that Myron Stout, a comparably obsessive and exacting abstract painter of a generation before us, or so before Tom's, was an avid reader of well, Western pulp fiction, in particular, Louis L'Amour, who I doubt was ever proposed for membership in this august body. Be that as it may, these were the passions that Tom avidly shared with friends and family, to the point of making what I consider a nearly definitive lift of film noir for the use of fellow addicts. I was already a fan of these genres, but I still am, still am working my way through having been, I'm still having, still making my way through having been provided a copy of it by his son Casimir, whose home movie you just saw, and who has uh, other commercial releases in the pipeline. I would add that Joyce Robbins Casimir's uh, mother and Tom's wife is a first rate painter and ceramicist whose work I included in an exhibition downtown last fall at the Milton and Pat Resnick and Pat Pazloff Foundation, which is located on Elder Street on the Lower East Side in a converted synagogue, which much like the one Tom, Joyce, and Casimir lived in for decades, is not far away from the set at the edge of Chinatown. All of which attests to the fact that, Pop, that Tom, who attended Cooper Union and was, aff was affiliated with the Co-op Gallery 55 Mercy Street in Soho, was as much a downtown Manhattan artist as anyone who ever belonged to or defined the New York school. Now, in conclusion, I have a bone to pick with Tom, and I'm and in saying goodbye to him, would like to do so, do so here as a warning to those who are inclined to turn him and his work into a cult. There's long been a tendency among those who are uncomfortable, with, but made uncomfortable by abstract painting, to seek key, a key ex, to explain, excuse me, to seek a key to explain themselves, uh, to, to explain it to themselves. The key they usually bring, uh, that key usually being an historical reference or symbolic form that justifies taking it seriously. In Casimir's film, Tom almost confirms that reflex by talking about the radiant halo of Christ in the Grunewald is nine altarpiece in relation to a similarly shaped form in one of his works. Forgive me for being skeptical, but that sounds like an artist free associating after the work has been done and taking pleasure in all the things his own creations remind him of in his well-stocked Musée Imaginaire. It does, uh, it does sound, it does not sound like someone trying to set out, it does not sound, it does not sound like someone you, uh, you something, excuse me. It does not sound like uh, telling someone what you set out to do and how you got it done. So I would discourage the impulse to footnote his pains and thereby drop anchor at the start of a voyage of discovery rather than urging people to cast themselves adrift on the currency of his formal and chromatic inventiveness. Um, that is what I have done whenever I've encountered examples of his work is how I came to know him and it. He's best, he is best understood as an artist of intervals and rhythms of unique and uniquely mutable shapes and colors, and above all, but an exceptional generosity of spirit. Based on an email from a student that I received this morning when, I was, when he inquired what, about what I was up to, and I told him that I was preparing this memorial, um, um, Tom should go down in history primarily for those qualities. I now offer his comments as a coda to my reflections as evidence that Tom's art is already making its emancipatory, having its emancipatory effects on artists of the future, thereby ensuring its posterity. Quote, I'm sorry about your friend Tom Laskowski. Seeing his work early on felt like being given permission to do things in paintings that I couldn't have otherwise painted. So he became one of my favorite painters, wishing you and everyone that well tonight at this memorial, Jonathan Laskowski. Thank you, Rob. Architect and Academy member, Robert A.M. Stern, will read the tribute to Kevin Roche. I'm honored to be asked to talk about my friend, Kevin Roche. The history of American architecture for the previous 50 years cannot be written without a focus on the work of Kevin Roche, who burst into prominence with the accommodating monumentality of his Ford Foundation headquarters of 1966 and his environmentally pathbreaking Oakland Museum of 1969. 
over 50 years time, Kevin Roach shaped and reshaped the Metropolitan Museum of Art, which is as much his legacy as that of its directors. In project after project, Kevin dazzled us with architectural possibilities that were not based on arbitrary personal whim, but on deep analysis of function that is needed to build intelligently and beautifully. I do not wish to turn the few moments allocated to me to the celebration of Kevin's life into an architectural history lesson. Rather, I'd like to say a few words, words about the man. I knew as a friend, Kevin was one of the funniest people I ever encountered. He had the great capacity to find humor in important events, and most significantly in events in his own life. He was a master storyteller. His account of his falling asleep and his job interview with his mentor, Eero Saarinen, after a night's carousing in New York was one of his best. His account of his time as a student at the Illinois Institute of Technology was priceless. Asked why he left that school after only one year, he said of the rigid pedagogy of the leader, Mies van der Rohe, I got it. Unlike most architects, Kevin could see humor in his own work. He could laugh at some of his architectural excesses. In a story he would tell from his student days in Dublin, he recounted his design for what he considered an up-to-the-minute modern house, featuring a circular stair connecting the bedrooms with the ground floor. His professor, unimpressed, sniffed. Circular stair? How will you get the coffin down? Kevin's pellucid 1984 account as the closing speaker of the inaugural Symposium of Columbia's Buell Center acknowledged the influence of his Beaux-Arts training in his office building for General Foods, as manifested by the 50-foot tall distraction of the lobby, do, uh, uh, lobby dome open to the garage below. Roche concluded his remarks with a description of the over-the-top arrival sequence at that lobby, where the disoriented first-time visitor introduces himself to the receptionist, who looks him in the eye and says with a straight face, may I help you? Kevin Roach was not only a towering figure in American architecture, but also an intelligent, witty, and deeply human being. His brilliance as a designer lay in an unerring sense of how to be completely modern without sacrificing the age-old principles that undergird architectural art. He was, our, he was a great communicator with drawings and models and words, a rare gift for any, any architect. He anticipated personal computing with analog techniques of analysis and graphic presentation that have only now become common digital practice. Kevin carved out new territories, not only in representing his work as a designer, but also in adopting new building technologies. When he embarked on individual practice at the age of 40, Kevin was already at the top of his game, the man to watch. 50 years later, he so remained. Kevin remained active in his practice to the very end. To many, his office building at Hudson Yards stands apart from the shameless, self-important posturing of too much recent commercial architecture. As with every building Kevin designed, it is notable for its clarity of expression, 
graceful proportions and elegant detail. With Kevin's departure, the house of architecture is substantially diminished and those of us lucky to have known him have lost the companionship of a great friend and a great man. Thank you, Bob. Academy member T.J. Anderson joins George Walker's two sons, Ian and Gregory, for a tribute to their father. Ian, who's a playwright and a filmmaker, will introduce George Walker. Composer and musician Gregory will then discuss his father with T.J. Anderson. The first, we have a clip of George Walker's lyric for strings, which was played at the Royal Albert Hall by, uh, Chineke, by the Chineke Orchestra as part of the BBC Proms Festival in 2017. Hello, can everyone hear me? Great, <clears throat> thank you. My name is Ian Walker, and I'd like to thank the Academy for this tribute to my father, George Walker, and to thank Cody Upton and Billy for inviting me to be a part of it. The lyric for strings, which you just heard a portion of, is especially poignant to me. It was one of several pieces that became the soundtrack to my childhood, often being blasted from my father's stereo in the middle of the night as I tried to fall asleep. The lyric was inspired by and dedicated to my father's grandmother who lived in his house when he was a child. She was an escaped slave and the sorrow, dignity and grace in which he saw in her is clearly present in the work. To understand my father and his music, you have to appreciate the time in which he lived. He was born in Washington DC in 1922 a time when racial strife was a constant, from the quiet institutionalized prejudice of one community to the out, violent outbreaks of another. For Black classical musicians and composers, the landscape was littered with barriers. When you read about my father's life, you're often presented with a long list of firsts. He was the first Black instrumentalist to solo with the Philadelphia Orchestra, the first Black instrumentalist to receive a graduate degree from the Eastman School of Music, and the first Black composer to receive a Pulitzer Prize in music. He was constantly pushing through barriers to reach new places, and that exercise in his life became a part of, of his music. He wanted to push the boundaries of what music could be, and more importantly, he wanted people to experience that music could be more, more complex, more thoughtful, more frightening, or moving, and that it could mean more to us. Because for him, music was a magnificent country. 
He composed over 90 works for orchestra, piano, strings, brass, woodwind, organ, guitar, voice, and chorus. He became a member of the Academy of Arts and Letters in 1999 and was inducted into the American Classical Musical Hall of Fame in 2000. He also received seven honorary doctorate degrees. But what most people don't know is that he actually had a number of passions. He uh, loved tennis, to play it and to watch it. He was drawn to poetry and photography, but I think his biggest passion might have been food. He was an excellent cook and every dinner was a five course event. Quite contrary to his musical instincts, he loved simple, precise, distinct flavors. And just about every dinner was a two hour affair filled with conversations about life, politics, and mostly, sometimes unendingly, about music. One of the people who came up most in those conversations was T.J. Anderson. They were born just six years apart and therefore experienced many of the same challenges, obstacles, and triumphs in the world of music. T.J.'s exceptional artistry and his contributions to the world of music, his warmth, and his friendship were things that my father cherished. And so it is with gratitude and humility that I'm able to pass the mic to T.J. Anderson and to my brother, Gregory Walker, now. Thank you very much. My name is Gregory Walker. I hope everybody can hear me. And I'm joined by composer T.J. Anderson. I'm glad to see you, Gregory. <laughs> it's been many years. As my brother Ian mentioned, uh, the association with T.J. was something that was uh, very meaningful to my father. My father, George Walker, certainly kept to himself and kept to his music in many ways, but I think that whether it was uh, just the, the friendship and camaraderie with TJ or just uh, the greater experience with Academy of Arts and Letters, the nurturing community is something that really uh, uh, empowered and I think kind of gave a, a stamp of uh, approval and encouragement that I would wish for any artist. Well, I certainly remember your mother and father well. And of course, one of these memorable moments came when I was, when I was on my way to McDowell Colony and they invited me to spend the night. When I arrived, they were, uh, they were very dour and down. And I was surprised, so I asked George, I said, George, what is the matter? What, what's gone wrong? And he told me he had just received notice from the music department of Smith College that he had not received tenure. Now, for me to hear that from a man who studied with the uh, most important teachers, both in the United States and France, and he said, and he told me that he had also done everything they asked of him. I was shocked. And uh, I said, George, this has nothing to do with music. And George looked at me and said, surprisingly, and I said, with two sons, two African-American sons, they have no intentions of you raising your boys in a college where there's a college for women. No intentions. He said, do you really think that's true? I said, yes, I do. And I said, if you were in, if I were in your shoes, the first thing I would do, I would call the affirmative action office of the state and accuse the Department of Racism, which he did. And of course, they investigated and, and they found the department guilty. Uh, George won the case. And then Smith College offered him tenure. He immediately resigned <laughs> and went, went to uh, Rutgers University, a position he held for the rest of his life. Now, this uh, a sense of, of, of being aware of the victimization of people because of race is something George was always aware of, particularly as a pianist, a phenomenal pianist 
but, but, but they, they had Andre Watts. They weren't thinking about George Walker, regardless of what he could do. I mean, it was just unfortunate. And yet George, through all of this, he went on not only playing the piano and giving recitals, he also created a body of music, which I think is most important. It's true that from the standpoint of a performer, whether one's an orchestral musician, certainly if one's a pianist, in my case as a violinist, there's a body of work that uh, he weighed in on. He definitely made his intentions known uh, during his lifetime, but now we have and we can move forward with. And I think that it's something that on a regular basis, I receive communications around the country about and people just uh, interested in bringing this music to life and interested in exploring this unique compositional perspective of someone who was a, a rugged individualist, I think, in many ways. As I mentioned with the American Academy itself, for whom we're just so grateful, there were just these oases of opportunities for him to be part of a larger artistic community. And one of the ones I remember him telling a story about was one that also involved TJ and Ulysses K and the great black composer Ollie Wilson, an orchestral reading that was done by the Atlanta Symphony in TJ's hometown there. And uh, as I recall, this was the year 1968 when they were all gathered together and uh, a number of the pieces were performed. I believe at that point it was my father's address for orchestra. And the story he tells is that in the same hotel you all were staying in, TJ, they were also having a Southern Christian Conference meeting, the other side of the building. And he talks about at one point going down to the lobby, getting some food, and then going to this conference room where he pressed his face against the glass. And in that moment, he glimpsed something. He glimpsed through the glass that there was a minister who stood up to embrace the speaker at this conference. And the moment only lasted you know, a matter of seconds before the doors actually opened up and he had to kind of step back. But for me, I think that the glimpsing of things we don't completely understand is pretty analogous to the experience that many concert goers, many performers uh, are going to go through when they're exposed to my father's work, especially the later ones that, as my brother said, do ask for more. They demand more from the performers and from the audience. You don't always understand what you're glimpsing in this music, but you know there's something there. In the case of this particular image that stayed with him for the rest of his life, he had seen through the glass minister embracing Martin Luther King, the only time he ever saw the man. And just as I think with his music, sometimes we don't completely understand what it is that's there in front of us, but uh, it has the power to illuminate a path forward. And I hope that with my father's music and all the performers who are able to uh, search for more within it, that uh, they too find a direction for themselves for something that's uncommon, for something that's individualistic, and for something that I think that ultimately has a power to give us a, a perspective on so many other things we love and hear in music and in the world. Well, Gregory, I would like to recommend uh, two pieces. Your father had an affinity for the theme in variation form. And I first discovered it when he had his first piano sonata, the slow movement. And uh, Oh, Bury Me Beneath the Willow was the, was the folk song that he used as the basis of the slow movement of that piece. And it's, it's fantastic. And this was followed up with, by a piece called Spatials, which, which to me is one of his great works because of its uh, harmonic vocabulary. It's for solo piano and it's a theme in variations also. I just think George was just a phenomenal 
composer. He saw so much in in music itself, in its ability to transform people. And I think we are very fortunate to have had him delivered on schedule. <laughs> Yes, thanks so much, TJ. It's just coming from you. It, it just it, it means so much that what he had hoped for, what he'd hoped to achieve and communicate was received and appreciated. And just, you know, on a larger scale, again, with the Academy, thank you, Billy, for bringing my family in for this presentation with my brother, Ian, my extended family with TJ. And congratulations, too, to our other featured artists and presenters today. It's just been a real privilege to be part of this. Well, thank you, Ian, Gregory, and TJ. And thank you to everyone for joining us tonight for this reading of tributes. Although we've been separated by a pandemic, we've come together tonight for a celebration, an incredibly rich feast from blueberries to resurrection. We hope that you'll join us for the next reading at 7 p.m. Eastern time on Thursday, January 28th, 2021. Until then, please stay safe, be well. Good night. <laughs>